Hey, this is Joe with Grow It Build It. Today we're going to talk about a tree species that you should not grow. Every spring when I drive around suburbia or strip malls or even the countryside, I see beautiful white trees in bloom. It's just about the earliest thing to bloom and leaf out, second only to bush honeysuckle. Large, beautiful, white blooming trees that I desperately want to cut down and kill. Why would I want to remove such a beautiful tree? Simple. It is an invasive species that causes a lot of harm to our environment. Commonly known as the Calorie or Bradford pear tree, Pyrus caloriana. Now, before you uh, turn this off, hear me out. If you're not familiar with this tree, you should be. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the tree for identification, then I'll go through its history, how it harms the environment, and then what you can do to help. So let's take a deeper look. The calorie pear tree is a fast growing tree that can reach heights of 15 feet tall in just five years, making it very attractive to new homeowners as it is very fast growing. And eventually it will reach heights of 50 foot with an elongated or globular crown. The bark is smooth and gray, will have length of cells, little white dots on it. For leaves, they're alternate and ovate in shape, roughly three inches long by one and a half inches wide. They're dark green in color and very shiny. If you hold one, it almost seems like it is covered in wax, actually. And in autumn, they make a brilliant dark burgundy color. In spring, it makes beautiful white flowers that are very attractive, but the odor isn't very pleasant at all. However, these flowers will eventually change to make small brown fruits, AKA pears, that mature in September and October. Although invasive, this tree is used by wildlife in a couple of ways. Bees will pollinate the flowers and birds and squirrels will eat these fruits and defecate the seeds all over the place. Birds in particular spread this tree by perching on power lines and fences and doing their business. And as these areas are often in full sun, they'll grow well and you'll see them everywhere. Okay, but how did this happen? What is the calorie slash Bradford pear tree? To understand how this tree became so ubiquitous in North America, we have to go back to the early 1900s. A botanist named Frank Meyer was sent to China to identify species of plants that could be of value to the United States. And edible pear trees in orchards were being decimated by fire blight. Frank Meyer learned about this problem from a local professor who had done research and found that only a Chinese specimen, Pyrus caloriana, had shown resistance to this blight. Thus, he was tasked to go locate more trees and obtain their seeds. And Frank Meyer was amazed at how adaptable Pyrus caloriana was. To quote from Isabel Cunningham's book, Frank and Meyer, The Plant Hunter in Asia, he learned that they grew on dry sterile slopes, in standing water, on ledges in the burning sun, in low bamboo jungles, or the burned over slope of a pebbly hill. So essentially, this tree could grow almost anywhere. Seeds were brought to the United States and were grown in USDA nurseries in Oregon and Maryland to try to develop a fire blight resistant tree. However, eventually the interest turned to grafting edible French pears onto the rootstock of Chinese Pyrus caloriana. In 1952, one of these trees was still growing at a USDA research station in Maryland. A Dr. John Creech noted it for its nice globular shape, thick glossy leaves, and was lacking in the small thorns that many of the calorie pear trees have. And this tree is the root of all evil when it comes to the calorie pear. As the USDA employee grafted skions onto the Pyrus calorie stock, he named the resultant cultivar Bradford. Now, this part of the story is important. Grafting is where we cut a small root stock in half and then tie a small branch from another species of tree on top of it. The resulting growth above the graft is all of the tree we tied on top. This results in all these Bradford pear trees being genetically identical, essentially, and pear trees need two different genetically unique trees to cross-pollinate and produce viable seed. So all the Bradford pear trees theoretically were sterile. but. Calorie pear trees sometimes will make new shoots from below the graft or even underground on the rootstock. Like this is an example from my yard right here where this is happening. If any of these branches are allowed to flower, now you're going to have flowers that are genetically different from the ones above. Thus you can have cross-pollination and produce viable seed. An additional problem with the Bradford pear was that the branch structure of it made a narrow angled V like you see here. This results in the tree branches being inherently weak and more prone to falling off during storms. This problem was noted by the 80s, and the nursery industry sprung into action, developing new cultivars from other Pyrus caloriana trees. With all these cultivars floating around, it's very easy to see how more cross-pollination could happen. And if viable seed is produced, the seeds that grow from those will be genetically different from the parents. 
possibly reverting back to the original species or just making new trees. It compounds the cross-pollination problem as more bees can pollinate more different trees. And thus this tree just seems to grow everywhere at this point. And if you guys want more details on this topic, I do have an article on this tree at my website, which I'll link to below. It has a lot more details than I'm going to give you in this video. But how does it all spread? Well, as I said earlier, birds are going to eat the seeds of this. And actually this picture here is of a cedar waxwing doing exactly that in my neighbor's backyard. He's going to go poop the seed out somewhere else and possibly make a new tree. So compounds the problem. But this problem took time to develop, but we've crossed the point of it being a theoretical risk and into a complete epidemic of this tree being seemingly everywhere along roadsides, abandoned fields, everywhere. But okay, why do they outcompete our native trees? Well, they grow very fast and in a huge variety of conditions, dry sites, moist sites, and all manners of soils. But they have one major advantage over our native oaks, maples, cherries, etc. Deer won't eat them. Deer browse and eat young saplings all the time, but the pear trees taste bad to them. Thus, they will grow tall while our native trees get eaten. So you have a total displacement of one mix of vegetation to a monoculture of this. Okay, well, why is this a problem? Well, I already stated how they displace our native trees. The main problem with this is that native trees host native insects. Native insects feed other insects and feed birds and are responsible for a lot of our biodiversity, our pollination, all of that. If we replace our native trees with this, we're going to lose a lot of species over time, at least locally. And if you're not sure about this, you can read some of Doug Tallamy's books or look at some of the studies that I cite at the end of my article uh, illustrating exactly this topic. Or just think critically about the problem. There's only so much space, and if more of it is taken up by trees that do not host native caterpillars or insects, that means fewer of them. Fewer specialty pollinators, less food for birds, all of this means a lesser ecosystem. Another part of this problem is that they leaf out early. That robs spring ephemerals of sunlight. Mature forests are awash in beautiful spring ephemeral flowers that only grow and bloom early in spring before the native tree canopies leaf out. But by the calorie pear trees putting out their canopy, they're effectively shading these out. So these gorgeous spring flowers like Virginia bluebells, Dutchman breeches, bloodroot, hepatica, they're not going to necessarily be around if they are under a canopy the whole time. They need that early spring sunlight. Okay, so how widespread is this problem? Well, in any abandoned field near me, it quickly gets overrun with these trees. They grow faster than everything else and they outcompete them. And guess what? When I bought my house, what kind of big tree was growing in my front yard? You guessed it, calorie pear. So I did the most environmentally friendly thing possible. I killed it. All right, so what can you do to help this problem? Well, first off, kill them. And how do you kill them? Well, if the tree is small, you can simply dig it out getting the root ball, but larger trees will need to be taken down with a chainsaw. Try to convince your neighbors just how bad these trees are. Show them. Two of my neighbors have actually cut down their trees. I'd like to think partly from my urging, but nonetheless, they're gone. If you're not competent with the chainsaw, hire someone who is insured to do it for you. And then have a stump painted with a herbicide so it doesn't re-sprout at the stump. Triclop here is my favorite chemical for doing this because it doesn't stick around in the environment very long. I've written about this on our website where I cite some studies from the University of Arkansas where they buried tubes filled with the soil contaminated with it and found that it was undetectable in six months. I also have a very detailed video on this exact method for killing trees and making sure the stumps don't re-sprout. I will link to that down below and in the card in the top right. But even if the stump doesn't re-sprout, the roots deep underground still will throw up shoots for at least a couple of years. I cut my tree down in 2020 and it's still throwing up little shoots here and there. Um, I pull them about twice a year, like in June and then again in August and that seems to take care of it. But it'll happen for a few years until the energy inside the roots is exhausted. Next, try to make the sale of this tree illegal. If you live in Ohio, Pennsylvania or South Carolina, good news for you is that this tree will be illegal in 2024. But if you don't live there, you can write to your local state representatives, senators, and Department of Natural Resources and tell them you want this listed as a noxious weed and banned for sale. The article that I wrote on this topic has studies listed at the end that you could include when you write to your representatives or senators. Studies that just say how bad this tree is. And finally, you can plant native trees instead. I list out some native alternatives to the calorie pear that are comparable in bloom, size, and growing conditions. Encourage people to plant these knowing that they host beneficial insects and keep up the good fight. But Eastern Redbud, Dogwood, Serviceberry are all great native alternatives to the calorie pear trees. 
Okay, so this was a somewhat different kind of video, but I hope that it gave you a good overview of this beautiful problematic tree and why you should absolutely kill it given the chance. I've got articles on topics covered in this video, so if you need a quick reference later, you can go to those. But if you enjoyed this, please give me the thumbs up as it greatly helps my channel out and I do appreciate it. And uh, share this with anyone who's considering buying a Bradford pear tree so they, you know, hopefully convinces them not to buy it. But if you guys have any questions, ask them in the comments. I'll try to answer them. And you all have a good day.